Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce Marty Epstein, uh, who is a composer, pianist, and a professor of composition at uh, Berklee College of Music. She also sits on the faculty of Boston Conservatory and recently received a Guggenheim Award. Um, she has described her music as slow paced, whispering rather than shouting, and cites her upbringing in Nebraska as an important influence on uh, her sound. And I think you'll hear that a lot in some of the music we'll listen to today. Uh, Marty, thank you so much for doing this. It's really nice to talk to you. And thank you for having me. It's my Great. pleasure. Um, congratulations also on the Guggenheim Award. That's a, that's a big deal. Yeah, uh, I should say that it was the 28th time I had applied. So the lesson there is just keep trying. Okay, that's, 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 that's actually, that is actually good. Nice to hear. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think like uh, your, your upbringing in Nebraska would be a really cool place for us to start. And I think that there's a, I was reading on your blog about uh, the way you describe your music. Uh, and of course, I've heard you at UC Davis also when you, when you came in, you talked a little bit about that as well. Um, so the, I think this, maybe the sense of time and, and the pacing of time is something that I've, I mean, I've been a big fan of your music for a while. And that's one of the things that I find really mesmerizing and very beautiful is, is that it's, it moves slowly and, you know, we'll play excerpts today, but the, um, I think you really need to listen to the whole thing, ideally in a live setting, even more, but still recordings are very beautiful. But there's a kind of a slow, gradual process that happens over a long time in your pieces. Um, so I wonder if you could talk maybe a little bit about your upbringing and how your kind of the place that you've grown up and your experiences with the environment have influenced the way you think about sound and, and music. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I was born in Colorado, actually, because my mother is from there, and my grandparents still lived there even after we moved to Nebraska, which meant we had many car rides um, across Nebraska um, from Omaha to, to Denver, and I have very, very strong memories of looking out of the window, you know, in the car, and just looking at the vast expanse of sky, you know, and, and of the land also, uh, even though Colorado is very rolling and, and Denver is at the foot of the mountains, um, most of Nebraska is completely flat, even though it, it goes at a slight incline. And, you know, some people think that that's boring and, and not beautiful, but it's definitely imprinted on me as something that I feel very nostalgic for and something that to me is very beautiful. Um, so, you know, honestly, I don't know if I consciously tapped into that um, from a compositional perspective until after I had already gotten through college and I was, and I kept finding myself, you know, writing music that was, that had a lot of space in it and had a lot of um, expansiveness in it. And I found myself being attracted to composers who are like that, like, you know, Sibelius is one of my favorite composers and it's, it's his expression of his, you know, Finnish ice cold landscape. Um, and, and I realized on a car trip back to Boston from Colorado that that was this thing that I kept trying to recall that, that experience of the landscape of Nebraska, um, and uh, it, it just it just dawned on me that that was the thing that that kept cropping up in my own music. Um, so that's in terms of the pacing, um, as I'm sure you know, Morton Feldman is also a big influence of mine. And um, I don't think he ever set foot in Nebraska, but he you know his landscape was Brooklyn, but his internal landscape was very much similar to what I what I'm expressing in my own music that that didn't answer your question about the sound but that answers your question a little bit about the the time and the expansiveness of it well time I think yeah it would be at least equally as important as, as sound but mm -hmm. um yeah do you feel like that's changed since moving to Boston or maybe as a result of moving to a place like Boston where you, like I think like you said there's a, a aspect of nostalgia you know I think of like Chopin too who when moved you know moved from like Poland and then lived in France, right? There's like all kinds of stories like that. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like, you know, I like the way you put it. Um, since moving to Boston, since moving to the East Coast, 
I feel like I am more than ever um, unconsciously and consciously carving out that space in my own music. I, I feel like I'm, I, I have this um, mental image of me literally, well, not literally, but you know, carving, carving out space that pushes away all the stuff that, you know, all the noise and all the activity, of course, noise and activity pre-quarantine, obviously, because, yeah. because now, you know, you walk outside in Boston and, and it's not crowded and it is expansive in, in a certain way. Um, but yeah, definitely since moving here, my music has become more extreme in that, in that way, for sure. Right. And actually, it's interesting that you mentioned that aspect of, well, sound, the sounds now in quarantine with less traffic and less activity. I mean, I think most of us think, especially those of us who live in uh, like city urban environments, think of silence as being very beautiful and always like rare and sought after, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I would agree with that. And, you know, I mean, Feldman would agree with that too. Mm -hmm. But um, But I think now, I mean, silence now has a little bit of a different meaning in the quarantine when you're if you're walking around like Boston and it's quieter than usual there's I mean that that can be beautiful you can hear birds but there's also a sense of you know anxiety or dread because of the meaning of those sounds yeah exactly I at night I like to walk across um the Longfellow Bridge which is um one of the one of the three bridges into Boston and um the red line that goes from South Boston to Harvard Square and, and a little bit beyond, it, it goes across that bridge. And normally I feel like the sound of the, of the train going by is kind of intrusive in whatever I'm experiencing as I'm walking. And now it feels, you know, it, it almost makes me feel sad when it goes by because we're not supposed to be riding the the um, the trains unless we actually have to get somewhere like for work or something like that. And and I just sort of, yeah, it's it, it makes me some of those city sounds make me feel um, a little bit sad. I would have to say because you miss those sounds because they have a they have a meaning beyond their sonic quality. Do and they have a rhythm too. They mm -hmm. they place a rhythm on on life that you take for granted, you know? So, yeah. yeah. But it has been, I have been noticing, and I, I've heard these stories from people all over the country. I have been noticing a lot more birds in my neighborhood um, and birds that I've never, or I, I was gonna say that I've never heard before. I should probably say that I don't remember having heard before, that I haven't noticed before. So that's, that's good. Um, strange, but. You know. but there are some there's always some beauty that can be found at least even in even in hard times like this yeah, that's for sure yeah um i'm curious if you i was i wonder if you could talk a little bit how about how it's maybe related to this topic of how has the crisis of climate change impacted the way you think about music and you know the way you think about nature in your music um at all or is it or maybe not i don't know that's that's something i think about sometimes in my own yeah. Um, I honestly get so stressed out and worried and upset by the thought of climate change that when I am creating music, I actively push that away, which I know sounds very, um, like I'm in a constant state of denial, which I kind of am. Um, but I think of art and my composing specifically, as kind of a, a, a safe haven in a way and something that can be experienced um, as kind of a respite from this constant reminder that not only is the climate changing, but now we have this pandemic around us. So I, I guess maybe that is a reaction to it. It's a reaction to it by denying it, I guess, or by trying to find a space that's separate from it. Um, but on the other hand, um, I do believe as um, Toro Takamitsu is also one of my big heroes and, and he always said that sound is a part of nature and because music is sound, 
his music is a part of nature. You know, people always said, oh, you know, Takamitsu is always trying to imitate nature in his music with all of his crazy titles. And he wasn't doing that at all. He was seeing or hearing his music as part of the stream of sound, but stream of sound that he's molding and shaping and, and presenting to the listener. And I guess that's how I think of my music too. Um, that I think that's one of the reasons why he's such a big influence for me. I think that's very eloquent. I think, yeah, I mean, Takamitsu is one of my favorite composers too, and definitely a, a master in terms of someone who addresses nature, but in, like you said, a very sophisticated way, not, not simply painting a picture, but, um, but yeah, thinking of what is nature, because it's so elemental and it's so fundamental to what mm. we are as humans, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Great. Um, so maybe you could tell us a little bit about the first piece that I have lined up, uh, Hot House, for two pianos. Mm -hmm. So um, you mentioned in your uh, Facebook post that you were looking for, for pieces that directly connected to nature. And, you know, in, in the broadest sense, you know, as I just said, all music directly connects to nature in some way. But this is a piece that was very specific in that regard, because um, I have these two friends who are married to each other, and they have um, a duo piano partnership, and they asked me if I would write a piece for four hands for them. And right before I started the piece, I was in Hawaii for the summer, um, and I was walking a lot, I was on the big island and I was walking a lot just in the neighborhood seeing all these incredible flowers and, and ginger plants and all this stuff that just grew wild that we could never have out here in the east. And so I started imagining if we could have these plants in a climate like Boston has, how could we have them? And I thought, oh, they'd have to all live in a hothouse. And so I started imagining what that hothouse might be like and it would be really humid and, and just sort of the air would just be completely um, fertile with with um, moisture and growth and things like that. And that was often what happens to me is I have a visual image and then that starts to suggest a sonic image. And so that imagining of being in a hothouse with all these plants that don't actually quite belong here, but they are here, um, that started to suggest to me this sound world that then became the sound world in Hot House. The other thing I'll say about Hot House is um, it has a very specific structure, which is that there are musical phrases and then there are phrases of, a, I'll say a lack of music. Some people might call it silence. Yeah. And gradually as the piece proceeds, the musical phrases get shorter and the silent phrases get longer. And I, I, I don't remember exactly, but I think I was trying to show that you know, the, the plants eventually, um, they, they die eventually, and then there's, there's the air just taking up the space where they were. And so that's, that's why that piece has that structure that it does. Great, oh, very beautiful. Okay, uh, let's listen to a little bit of that piece right now.
hate to stop it, cut it off there, but uh, thanks. I Somewhere. <laughs> yeah, we'll have a, I'll have a link that you can listen to the whole thing as well in the video below. But um, yeah, I think it's interesting, the lack of sound uh, and the, the silences. Well, they're not really silences. I mean, you didn't call them that, but they're, but the piano is holding the pedal, right? Exactly, exactly. And, and that process, like you said, it gets longer and longer. It must be really intense to hear live, I imagine. Yeah, it's, it's maybe even more intense to play it. Um, and I've, that's me playing with, um, with a friend of mine. And I much prefer the experience of being in the audience hearing someone else play that piece than playing it. Because yeah. you, the concentration that you have to have when you're counting the rests and um, and, and when you're counting rests like that, they feel so long, you know, which is one of the reasons why I think it's important to play my own music, because I do have a lot of space in my music, which when you're in the audience doesn't seem, you know, egregiously long or anything like that. But when you're performing it, it does. And I, and I think it's important for me to understand the experience of the performer in that. Um, but yeah, I like hearing that piece more than playing it. Yeah. That's, sure. that's really that's really interesting. Yeah, I can yeah. imagine if you're. But on on the other hand, if you're at the piano, you can hear those resonates much closer than yes than being in the audience. Uh, which I mean, that's something I find. I mean, I love resonance in the piano too myself. The dynamic level of that piece is um, is extremely low, but. What I've always done performing it live is I've always boosted the dynamic a little bit, uh, depending on the hall that it's being played in, because it, it, you know, if you play it too softly, then you don't hear any of the resonance at all. So, right. Yeah. Do you ever change the length of the rest? No. Depending on the hall. No. So, so, in, so you, but you adjust the volume. Yeah. To yeah. make sure that you have enough resonance. Right, because the the structure, the length of the rest um, is really critical to the structure of the whole piece. Because the very last rest is the same length as the very first chunk of played music. And those kinds of things are very important to me. I don't know um, how consciously a listener is aware of those kinds of things, but I believe that subconsciously people are very much aware of um, formal structures and proportions and things like that. And that's in a way the the thing that I think about and work on first in my music. It's usually the the pitch and the specific rhythmic relationships that come last. It's mm. trying to work out the the shape of the piece and the form of the piece that comes first usually. Right. And maybe those things are felt too, like like you said. It's not that people are sitting there listening, oh wait, how many beats how many right. beats are there? That's not I don't think that's a fun way to listen. But no. you can feel the you can feel a clear process happening. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. That's <laughs> cool. Um, let's uh, let's listen to the next piece, uh, Komorebi, which is one of those beautiful Japanese words that has a very specific meaning. Yes. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about that that one as well. Yeah. So that word means, um, or it refers to when when sun light shines through the leaves of trees and, and the way it reflects onto the ground from the shadow of the leaves. And that image, when I, I have this book called Otherworldly, not otherworldly, but otherworldly. And it's this book of all these incredibly beautiful words from other languages. And I read through it every once in a while to get titles or, you know, just for fun. And I came across that word and you know, as often happens to me, I immediately started hearing music relating to the visual image. Um, and around the same time, I got a commission from Windsor Music in Boston to write a piece for violin, oboe, and clarinet. And it just seemed like, you know, all of those instruments are made out of wood. And I started thinking about, you know, the trees that they all might have come from. And it just sort of all gelled from there, I would have to say. Great. Um... Okay, well, I, I'll, we can, let's talk about it after, after listening. Here, I'll play a little uh, excerpt. Okay.
So what kind of uh, feelings related to this idea of Como Rebbe were you, um, do you feel like you captured it? I mean, I, I could talk about it too, but, 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 but I wanna, but what, what do you, what do you, um, what do you think uh, you're capturing there? There's many, I think there's many layers to it. Yeah, um, that's such an interesting question um, because I didn't intend for it to be a literal representation of what the visual would be, but I do think there, there are places where the instruments, especially um, from the beginning, the instruments sort of interlock in a, in a way, they're all kind of playing the same material, but at different times in kind of a canonic sort of a way, which, you know, made me think of um, leaves that are sort of all the same, but they're all different. And the way the, the sunlight sort of splashes onto, onto the ground. And so the sort of intertwining of the musical ideas in my mind, was connected to that and it's it's important to say in my mind because i think that compo and you know this because you're a composer but composers get ideas for their music from often non-musical things or in the case of what we're talking about nature or visual art and that connection is made inside our own heads and our own psyches and that's what produces the piece and we're not expecting the listener to say, oh yeah, you were writing about this time when the leaf did this thing, you know? And I want, the, I want people to know what the title is because I want them to know what the inspiration is, but I'm not expecting them to have a very literal experience of it. You know, sort of like what we were saying about Takamitsu. It's more like an expression of it or, or an expression of the alchemy that happens when those things combine in my own um, creative mindset more than anything. Um, the thing that people always comment on in this piece is the part that, that we were just hearing before it stopped, which is the place where everyone is in unison. Um, I've had people tell me that that's a shocking spot in that piece because no one ever writes unison music for chamber ensembles. And it just seemed like the, as I was writing it, it seemed like the most logical thing to do in that moment. And so I don't really know how to interpret that when people say that to me. Listening to that piece, I found it, I found it very shocking too, but, but mainly in the way that you set it up, I think. It's mm -hmm. a very, because it, like, it's, it's, again, it's one of those processes that happens so gradually. Like, mm -hmm. we think, you know, we're listening and we think, yeah, this, this very, there's this very beautiful interplay between the three instruments. And then, and then like, just sudden, it's not, it's not jarring, but then it's, it's just, you kind of listening and you, and you think, oh, they're all playing together now. Like, yeah. you think that was going to happen. Yeah. And not only that, they sound, and this is what my intent was, they sound like a fourth instrument. You know, mm -hmm. they sound like a completely different instrument, which is um, one of the reasons why I'm always trying to get my students not to use MIDI when they compose, because MIDI doesn't capture that kind of a special thing that can happen in orchestration. Um, so, I mean, that's, I, I was just imagining, you know, Vine sort of intertwining and sort of becoming all connected together. Um, and again, that's the alchemy that happens in my mind, not the, not that I'm trying to get you to say, oh, that sounds right. like it's intertwining, you know. You know, I'm actually really glad that you mentioned that and that you're, that you're talking about that because this is something that it's sometimes it's hard for me to explain to people too, which, and I think it's really important is that, I mean, yeah, composers, you know, we have to figure out some way to come up with ideas, right? And, mm -hmm. and often those, often those can come from nature. And like you said, it's a, it's a very, it can be a very useful way of coming up with material for a piece and, you know, helping guide decisions, but ultimately it's music, right? And it's something, and, and having a title like Como Rebbe, that will evoke something in somebody's mind too. And people, you know, everyone's different. So there's the title and then there's the music that they hear and mm -hmm. people will connect those in a certain way and everyone mm -hmm. will do it differently. And I think that that's how it should be. I think yeah. personally, yeah. I'm, I'm not interested in people imagining what I imagine. I'm interested mm -hmm. in people imagining something, having some reaction or some response. It doesn't have to be mine. It's even more interesting if it's not mine. But I do think it's, it's you know, I've thought a lot about this, how we as composers can 
make our music be, um, I don't want to use the word accessible, but how we can invite any audience in to listening to our music. And I don't think the answer is to try to guess what they want. I think the answer is to try to give them a window into our process. How, you know, what inspired us to write the piece and then invite them in to try to listen as carefully as they can. Um, my former teacher, Bernard Rand, says the most beautiful thing he says about this. He says, you come to a piece with an open heart and an open mind, and you can have a good experience no matter what your personal experience is with modern music. And I think that's, that's the goal. You know, that's what we should do. I think that's a great place to leave it for us. Uh, thank you so much for doing this, Marnie. It's been really super interesting talking to you about your music. It's great to see you.